So Fastlane is in the books. Time to engage Muttley mode. In three, two, one. <laughs> That's what I get. That's what I get. I didn't learn my lesson from Survivor Series. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. It could potentially be good. I might actually enjoy it. <laughs> That's what I get. That's what I get, people. See, this is what happens when I try to be optimistic. See, this is what happens when I try to extend a very undeserved benefit of the doubt. I present to you on a silver platter WWE Fastlane 2017. So for those of you that are harping on me to be more positive, I say, fuck you, you got what you deserve tonight. Oh my god. What a steaming pile of shit this was. And I do not think that this is typical Jeff ranting for the hell of it or trying to be counterculture. Like, I actually think this is going to be one of those times where I kind of blend in with the crowd on a lot of this. Because this show sucked. It was fucking terrible. <laughs> oh, but that finish. Oh, that finish was masterful. A stroke of genius. <laughs> Let's go ahead and talk about Fastlane for no other reason than to get it the hell done and over with. We kick off the main card with the Destroyer taking on the Uber driver. Now, of course, instead of it being something productive, where it was a complete and total one-sided domination, where both of the guys potentially get over because the destroyer actually destroys somebody, but the Uber driver, uh, you know, sits there and continues to fight and continues to basically just take a shit kicking, if nothing else, and that's how you get the guy over, would make this a much more 50-50 type of affair than it was supposed to be and should have been. While it was not completely a 50-50 match, and sure, Samoa Joe dominated stretches of it, it was not the type of match that we fucking should have gotten. It was far too competitive, and ultimately, at the end of the day, it really doesn't accomplish a whole lot of anything. And for those of you that want to talk about when these two guys would have a great match on NXT, who gives a fucking shit? This is the main roster now. For all you crybabies crying about this Uber driver bitch being in this type of position where he's just there to flop around and make other guys look better and get them over, well, at least he has that fucking role. And that's the fucking role he should have. Because if we think that that lame fuck deserves to be anywhere near the top of the WWE hierarchy, it is, again, a further representation of exactly why the fuck this company and the business as whole is in the goddamn shape that it's in, and you should be ashamed of yourself. And I don't know what the fuck happened, but this shit needs to stop. But a blown opportunity for me, for my money. Anyways, moving on. It wouldn't be the first blown opportunity and missed <laughs> chance or booking decision for the night. The tag title match. Enzo and Cass taking on the bald club of jobbers. Somebody tweeted at me and said, how do I think the club could be more relevant? I said, maybe they can go back to Japan. Just throwing it out there. Now, in the match itself, you know, I'm always hopeful when you get tag team matches because even if there's not a lot of story in them, tag team matches in and of themselves open themselves up to potentially being good. You know, especially if you follow, to me, kind of a tried and true formula for how to do a tag team match. And in this match, you've got Enzo, who is a really good, natural, kind of sympathetic heat getter. That way you can build up and build up and build up to Kaz and that hot tag. But what annoys the fuck out of me is when we finally get that hot tag, it's not nearly with the amount of drama or suspense of building up to the hot tag that you get from really, really good tag teams. And then once Cass is actually tagged in, instead of both Anderson and Gallows being there in position to feed into him multiple times and working off of that for a couple of minutes, you've got Anderson in the ring and Gallows is nowhere to be fucking found. But nonetheless, it's just... At the end of the day, the club goes over here, and I would have rather they just got 
the title change done and over with because what's the alternative? If you don't do it here, you do it on the WrestleMania pre-show, which you would think based off of the number of matches that you're going to have to have based off of the brand split, there are going to be a lot of matches on the damn pre-show or a lot of belts that aren't defended at the biggest show of the year. Now, at the end of the day, that could mean that this Raw tag title match happens on the WrestleMania pre-show. Um, but because it involves Enzo and Cass, and you want to give that team a WrestleMania moment and put them on the main WrestleMania card like they deserve, if this title change happens on the WrestleMania main card, then cool. I can live with this. But if not, what the fuck? Why didn't you just go ahead and do it here? If they sit there the next night on Raw or a week or two weeks later and they do the title change then, then all of this is fucking stupid. But speaking of stupid, for some point in time, for some reason, we needed to have Stephanie McMahon on the phone with Mick Foley. Just why? This, we needed this? Did this really tie into any fucking thing? No, it really didn't. Maybe this is them continuing a story that builds up to Kurt Angle taking over for Mick Foley as the next general manager of Raw. I don't fucking know. But all it leads up to is Stephanie saying something about making sure that things go off without a hitch. So, of course... That would equate to, instead of focusing on somebody not getting involved in Reigns and Strowman, we sit there and not go talk to Chris Jericho about Kevin Owens versus Goldberg for the Universal title, because it would be a real reason for Chris Jericho to want to interfere and get involved in that match with everything on the line. We go seek out Samoa Joe for some fucking unbeknownst reason to me. Storyline continuity, anyone? Anyone? Where in the fuck did this come from? Why would Triple H, frankly, give a fuck about that Universal title match? Because in the grand scheme of things, in terms of the story right now, it's not in Triple H's orbit. So why the hell would God care? It's just ridiculous. Moving on. Sasha Banks versus Nia Jax. Nia Jax, Nia Jax, I don't give a shit. My thing with this is, the babyface does not always have to win to get revenge. Furthermore, they should not always win to get revenge. When you are trying to build up a monster, which is what you should be doing with Jax, then the babyface, especially Sasha in this case, who is literally less than half the size, should not be going over here. Especially in some dumb dick type of fucking fashion where you do some stupid ass roll up. That's just dumb. Having your monster woman is bad enough a couple months ago at pay per view, you're having her fucking tap out. Now you're having her lose in this way. If anything, the way you've been doing with Charlotte. And the pay-per-view streak, oh, we'll get to that in a minute. If anything, you should be building up Nia Jax to be the one to end that streak at WrestleMania. So this match was a fucking waste of time. I saw somebody tweet about how it reminded them a lot of Samoa Joe and the Uber driver. And there were some similarities there. Uh, but at least with Samoa Joe and the Uber driver, the right guy ultimately went over in the right fashion in terms of the finish. You can't say that about this women's match here. And furthermore, it just exposes the fact, when it comes to the Raw women's roster, it's basically about four bitches, and that's it. They are the breakfast bitches now. Because they're the only four getting any tick whatsoever. It's ridiculous. But after this, knowing, and all of us should have known going into this, that you weren't going to get a lot in terms of time out of that main event for the Universal title. You had to know that there was going to be some inevitable filler coming. Oh, boy, did we get some filler. It was the let's fill time for the inevitable main event squash match by having Cesaro face off against Jinder Mahal. And it struck me as I'm watching this match just how much Jinder Mahal looked like a roided-up soup Nazi. Is I'm legit about that. Just think about it. Minus the mustache, of course. But Jesus Christ. And what's sad about this is that Cesaro had to win because of Jinder Mahal getting distracted by Rusev. Um, and then number one, why does Rusev have, have a different haircut now? Instead of doing like a, a hair versus hair match or something, you know, something that might actually sell some tickets or try to make some money, he just randomly fucking did it. You could have played off of the handsome Rusev shit even more. Why does Cesaro only win because of, inner, of a distraction 
uh, for Jinder Mahal by Rusev. Oh my God, and then to make it worse, now Rusev's got to get his fucking opponent because Mick Foley freaking said so, and now it comes the big show. And it was at this point in time that it decided to drop an absolute emergency deuce. Emergency deuce. And from the looks of it on social media, I didn't miss shit by taking a shit. So let's move on. At this point in time, I think everybody was kind of at wit's end already, and the show was only about half over, saying, oh my God, this is terrible. And then the Cruiserweight title match happened. Gentlemen, Jack Gallagher and Neville, they did their damn finest to save this show. This, to me, was a very good match. This was a fun match. I enjoy guys that don't just do spots for the shit all of doing spots, but they actually make sense either to the characters or to the story that is attempting to be told during the match. And that's what we got here. I enjoyed this very, very much, even though Gentleman Jack didn't have his day, and while surely many of you were still reveling in the joys of thinking about Austin Aries' package and how nice it was, you know, at the end of the day, this Cruiserweight title match was easily, easily the best match of the night for me. This was a money match. And it makes me hopeful that we get something good for these poor cruiserweights at WrestleMania. But don't hold your breath. So at this moment, I'm like, okay, maybe this flips the show a little bit. <laughs> Never get to Roman Reigns for his Braun Strowman. <laughs> Now, maybe the WWE, again, lives in a John Cena-based type of fantasy world when it comes to Roman Reigns, and they figure that as long as people are reacting, whether they boo or cheer, it really doesn't matter because they're in the reaction business, and that's what they told themselves and conned themselves into believing is okay and good and, you know, the, the reality of things. But it's not. And if you really want the guy to have any chance of success, then you really shouldn't go down the path that you would with John Cena with Roman Reigns. So, of course, they do. Seems so typical. Build up a dude into a big freaking monster. He runs through a bunch of jobbers and other freaking low to mid card type of guys just so that way the conquering hero can come in and bash him, vanquish him like there was nothing to it. No repeat match, no return match is necessary because it's one and done, motherfucker. And any future match is only about getting the conquering hero babyface even more over. See, this is the type of shit that makes people resent a Roman Reigns, even when, for all intents and purposes, they shouldn't have to have a ton of reasons to resent Roman Reigns. Because while people want to talk about how he really can't talk, let's face it, it's not exactly like... Dean Ambrose and Seth Rollins, his S.H.I.E.L.D. cohorts, are exactly tearing up the world on the microphone either. And from an in-ring standpoint, he's most certainly better than Dean Ambrose. And frankly, I think his match quality doesn't take much of a step back to Seth Rollins either. There are things that could be inherently likable about Roman Reigns, potentially in theory. But because of what this company does, and their stubbornness, and their insistence upon this, I understand what you're building him up for. I understand you're building him up for The Undertaker at Mania. I get that. But why not just have Taker get involved here? You didn't even have to have Taker show up. Just run a video package. You know, have a lightning bolt come down from the sky. Have the lights go out. Have the druids come out. There's any number of things the WWE could have done here from a creative standpoint that would have made this match work so much better than what it ultimately did. But again, that's not what it was about. It was all about Roman Reigns beating Braun Strowman, period. Who gives a shit about Braun? It's all about Roman. It's not about Strowman. It's about Roman. It's about time everybody gets in line with that. And if this match doesn't prove that Roman Reigns is full-fledged breakfast club material, I don't know what the hell does. Uh, getting guys built up specifically just so he can squash them, numerous world title reigns, getting a featured featured match at Wrestlemania that frankly he doesn't merit and he doesn't deserve he's made a daughter what more can you really say the company pushes him even if fans are sitting there saying they don't want the guy to be pushed Reigns is full-fledged breakfast club now but I think with all of this I think most people weren't surprised I think there's one hashtag that perfectly sums all of this up L -O, hashtag lol Roman Reigns what more can you really say? I think 
hashtag LOL Roman Reigns, encapsulates everything about this fucking match. And just like so many other things in WWE, all that buildup of Braun Strowman, just for Roman to beat him clean right here, the first chance he got a crack at him, just shows how so much of what WWE does today is a gigantic waste of everybody's fucking time. Speaking of gigantic waste of fucking time, this Raw Women's Championship. The Raw Women's Division in general is one gigantic waste of time. But you've got Bayley defending against the Queen of Pay-Per-View. Charlotte's 16-0 in singles matches at Pay-Per-View. She's never been beat at a singles Pay-Per-View. And it makes you start to wonder, number one, based off of what happened in this match, are you trying to secretly turn Bayley heel by having Sasha Banks blatantly come out and interfere in this match, which should have led to a disqualification? But, of course, it didn't. Because at least then, if it would have ended in a disqualification, you could have at least given Charlotte the victory. She doesn't lose, yet Bailey still retains the title. That would have made some sense. No, instead, you've got to go full throttle, balls to the walls with this shit, where Sasha interferes, yet Charlotte goes back in, just so that way Bailey can beat her straight up. Are you fucking kidding me? It, it's literally like they're trying to turn Sasha Banks and Bailey heel. I don't know what the fuck is going on here. Furthermore, I am no fan of penis power by any stretch of the imagination. When I look at Charlotte now, I look at her face, and I think, more, more. But, with that said, if you're going to go there with the streak, and you're going to sit there and build this thing up, and actually attempt to try to make this fucking matter, the dumbest thing you could possibly do is just basically throw it out with the trash, at a secondary filler pay-per-view. So, of course, the WWE decided for some unknown particular fucking reason that they were going to have Charlotte lose this match here. Not even as the champion. Like, I could even somewhat understand, not really, but kind of, if Charlotte was the champion and Bailey won it here, but this is how fucking stupid this company is. They'd have Charlotte win at the pay-per-views just to lose her title at fucking Raw. And now you get to this point in time, the one thing she really had to hold on to was the fact that she had never been beaten, pinned one-on-one -on -one at a pay-per-view. And now you've taken that away from her. So she's not the champion and she doesn't have the pay-per-view streak. And you did it before fucking WrestleMania. At least if you're going to do it, wait until the biggest show of the fucking year. This was just ridiculous. And now, with all the crap that you did with Charlotte, that just ended up being one gigantic waste of fucking time. That's what it is. A gigantic waste of fucking time. Like so many other things in this company, and in particular, so many things on this goddamn show. But then we get to the main event. Goldberg versus Kevin Owens for the WWE Universal Championship. The one thing I can say is that Goldberg's matches in WWE now don't waste my time because there's not enough time that goes by to actually waste my goddamn time. If you were of any delusions that this match was going to go of any real length or time, you were sadly, sadly mistaken. Now, first and foremost, before you just bitch about the fact that the 50-year-old guy with the gray in his goatee squashed the dude that's been a universal champion for a while at least give the WWE this. They didn't just have Goldberg murder Kevin Owens for the sake of murdering Kevin Owens. They had Chris Jericho's music hit as soon as the bell freaking rang to provide a distraction so that way Kevin Owens was caught off guard and caught by surprise. This is not quite the same as Goldberg doing what he did to Lesnar at Survivor Series which is basically Lesnar got in a little offense and then Goldberg came storming back and squashed his fucking meathead ass. Here, at least, there was at least some storyline reason or purpose that played into this and how everything went down and how ironic it was. From all those years back, choking out Goldberg backstage, now it's Chris Jericho on screen that's helping Bill Goldberg win the WWE Universal Championship. Oh, what a moment. <laughs> oh, what a way to end this night. <laughs>
then let me bitching reign supreme. I don't give a fuck. The only thing I cared about on this fucking show was Goldberg winning this goddamn title. And I got it. So yes, this show sucked. Donkey Dick, but the company at the end of the day, as they so often do, will occasionally give me that one fleeting moment, that one real hope spot that sucks me in and keeps me coming back. And that's what this is. They threw me a freaking barren here, okay? And no matter what you say, it's not going to ruin it for me. This whole shit about it's not believable that a Goldberg will come back and win. Have you looked at most of the fucking roster? And most of the guys that you would put in the main event scene, you tell me 50 or not, you wouldn't look at Bill Goldberg and say he could probably beat most of those dudes' asses. Come on, get real. Number two, if Brock Lesnar did this shit, y'all would be fucking drooling over yourself and making fucking Jimmy John sandwiches out of your penises and jacking off to it with a fucking tub full of mayonnaise. That's exactly what the hell you would do. You'd be like, oh my god, it's a cold cup combo, baby. And you know you fucking would. You know it. You know it, damn it. Number three. And and, and here's, here's, here's the thing. Is that you want to talk about, you know, what does that say about the future? In terms of the talent, what is, type of future does this company really fucking have anyways? Just because in theory they might have some younger dudes. Look at the fucking talent. And I use talent as a very loose term. Who do you really have that could be a bedrock for a successful mainstream international company for years to come? The answer is you fucking don't. And at this point in time, because of the fact that WWE has went down the part-timer track for so many fucking years and so many goddamn hardcore fans who this company continues to listen to at an increasing fold for whatever fucking reason I do not know and I do not understand, continuing to get behind these fucking lame-ass spot monkeys that can't sell any fucking thing in the especially sell an audience on why the fuck they would want to sit down and watch them perform or buy tickets to the goddamn show. What fucking future do you have? Let's worry about the present at this point in time. Fuck the future. We've been talking about the future for years, and this is where we ended up any fucking ways. But most importantly, it just proved that Goldberg's boss. He most certainly showed Sting how it's done. He showed Lesnar how it's done. And frankly, he's showing the Breakfast Club how it's done. Goldberg, after being gone 12 and a half fucking years, gets the WWE to put him in a position where they bring him back at Survivor Series and squash Brock Lesnar in, what, a minute and 26 seconds. The dude who obliterated John Cena. The Brock Lesnar, mind you, that when he came back from fucking UFC, where he was at one point in time the UFC heavyweight champion of the world, he still had to play the game, if you will, and job out to John Cena at Extreme Rules 2012. That same Brock Lesnar, four years plus later, is sitting there jobbing out to Goldberg at fucking Survivor Series in a minute and 26 seconds. Sting, the icon, one of the true greats of all time, one of the measuring sticks of the business for a decade and a half. He comes into WWE with all these years of past accolades, and his first match is WrestleMania. He's jobbing out to God. And almost playing second fiddle to a freaking DX click versus NWO fucking showdown. And then the Breakfast Club. If you want to say that put Goldberg in the Breakfast Club, how dare you insult Bill Goldberg like that? Bill Goldberg makes sons. Bill Goldberg makes big money and only has to work a couple of matches. And the matches that he works only go two minutes or less. The Breakfast Club, at least to hold their main event top spots, have to perform relatively consistently. And most of their matches have to go 10, 15 minutes or longer, and they have to wrestle on television. Goldberg ain't got to do any of that shit. And he basically just got handed the Universal title. And I don't give a shit if this means that he's just going to be handing it over to Lesnar at WrestleMania. I'll cross that bridge when we fucking get to it. And if some of you that are going to sit there and bitch about that now, you weren't bitching about it a few years ago when I talked about how stupid it was going to be to have Lesnar as a part-time champion, now that karma's going to come back about you in the fucking ass. And I don't care. I think it's glorious. Goldberg is boss. I wish I could politic my way to shit like Bill Goldberg has. But this is a master stroke. All the people in the shoot interviews over the years talk about how Goldberg didn't get the fucking... Uh, 
concept of the wrestling business, didn't fully understand the business, and didn't always give the best advice. What the fuck are you smoking? Because based off of what I see, Bill Goldberg is one of the great puppet masters in professional wrestling history, and is easily, easily the most adept and skilled at using leverage of anybody on that fucking roster today, up to and including God. It's incredible. Incredible. So while the WWE gave me this one glorious moment, and it was that glorious moment for me, this show is still shit. If you weren't already excited for WrestleMania, this show sure as hell wasn't going to help you along in that path. Frankly, if you somehow were excited for the potential of WrestleMania, this show most certainly didn't help you in that category either. This was your last major, major show before Mania, and this is the crap they give us. Doing good wrestling or good sports entertainment or good whatever the fuck you want to call WWE as a company now cannot possibly be this hard. But again, who gives a shit? Goldberg is boss. And everything else about this company pretty much fucking sucks right now.